Salamat Kim. Thanks Kim for that kind uh, introduction. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, the, the, the people who took their time out and came here. Uh, I saw my clip of a pump. <laughs> of course, uh, um, uh, my co-worker, my, my boss in the farm, in the house, incidentally is here. Uh, Dr. Bernadette is there. And some of my former graduate students uh, and my current graduate students. Uh, I understand there are also some uh, DEPCOM students here and, and some staff of, of Philippine Rice Research Institute. Uh, uh, thanks for taking your time for coming over. Uh, there are three key words, SRI and organic. Uh, to a number of people, these two words uh, become infinity. Uh, I, I do not know whether uh, it is the same. The flow of presentation is as follows. Uh, more of the background, the rationale, and the need for the study, and the approach of methodology uh, employed, results, discussions, recommendations and conclusions. Uh, of course, uh, there we are, uh, here in the Philippines, uh, 7,100 islands, uh, low flight or high tech, I don't know, uh, while we are rice growing, rice eating people, it's because of our Latitudinal and longitudinal location. I always emphasize this. Uh, uh, we are about uh, somewhere here, 40 degrees north above the equator, this is the equator, and over there on top is about 20, 20, 40 degrees above the equator. Uh, we are an archipelagic or island country, that's the reason why. We have uh, uh, complex weather. Uh, right now, you know, with climate change, uh, El Nino is a uh, household uh, buzzword, but not all parts of the country are affected by, by El Nino. Uh, some are affected in, in varying ways, and that's precisely because we are an island country and our location is dangerous. Uh, climatically speaking, uh, I was informed uh, by one graduate student that the Philippines is one of the most complex in terms of, of climbing. So, student in agrometeorology uh, uh, are somehow with uh, to study <laughs> the climbing of the Philippines. About 15 degrees north of uh, the latitude, then we have already been dry climbing. So that's the reason why northern Luzon is a little bit drier. So, okay, so much a little bit of that. But uh, what I just want to emphasize, rice became a staple food in our country because we are really situated in a relatively wet weather or a lot of rains. Even if we have what we call El Nino, Relative to Africa, or many dry countries, we are still wet. <laughs> we still receive something like 1,500, 1,600 millimeters of rain. Uh, and because of that, rice uh, is a key crop for this particular environment. So, uh, you know, rice is gifted with that hereditary muscles that uh, allows it to respire. Another water. But because of that, also, we are located in what we call intertropical convergence zone. And then under normal situation, still we are receiving 18 to 20 typhoons in a year. But you know, without typhoon, we don't have rains. 60 to 70 percent of our rains are brought about by typhoons. Without typhoons, then Metro Manila will become unlivable because of pollution. So what cleans or what uh, drives away those toxic gases in Metro Manila uh, are the typhoons, the prosthetons. <coughs> so going to the topic about rice, we grow it in irrigated, rain-fed, small amount of rain-fed areas. Uh, 
produce uh, uh, lucky we are produce uh, 20 tons uh, <coughs> 20 million tons of methane normally we produce about 19 to 20 million tons uh, I was mentioning rice became our staple food uh, supplying 40 to 65 percent of the caloric energy requirements of right now at the end of the year we will be about 104 million and by uh, uh, 2025, at the minimum, we will be about 120 million. Uh, that is the projection of Philippine Statistical Authority at 1.59 population growth rate. You may disagree with, with them how they came up with that prediction that from 1.9% growth rate, we will be down to something like 1.59. So earlier, by 2025, the population projection is about 140 million. Now they, uh, they are anticipating that we will just be about 120 million. But we will keep uh, with that number. How do we can we be sufficient price? I did a little arithmetic uh, using the caloric intake from 40% to 65% uh, may eat less uh, than uh, males uh, may perhaps up to 1,900 uh, calories per day uh, males 2,400 calories per day so if we use uh, the 40% caloric intake that will translate only to 69 kilograms per year for the females and roughly 87 kilograms for males, or an average of 78 kilograms per year for both sexes, at one is to one ratio. Okay? But if our caloric intake is 65%, for female it will be 112 kilograms for males, it's 140 kilograms per year, or an average of 127 kilograms per year. Take note in 2008. Our per capita consumption was estimated at 128 kilograms. That was that is the reason why we became the number one rice importer because of that simple arithmetic that they did in estimating our rice requirement. In 2004, our per capita consumption was only 104 kilograms. Uh, what happened uh, by? 2008, it became 128 kilograms. <laughs> uh, they used a formula, they call it SUA, Supply Utilization Approach, uh, which was used by the Central Intelligence Agency in estimating the military logistic requirements. They tried to using it for predicting uh, price, but they use it uh, wrongly. Uh, the result should be per capita supply available. It should not per cap be per capita consumption. So uh, that's how it was explained by us uh, during the discussion when we questioned them. Why? What happened? Why suddenly? <laughs> uh, after that, when we discovered that, I uh, happened to discover that formula. So we had to be uh, uh, computation. So now our per capita consumption is down to 140 kilograms. But we're still we're not happy with that. I'm I'm not happy with that uh, uh, per capita consumption. Perhaps 100 kilograms per capita would be okay. Uh, 87 to me is alright. That means we have to diversify our caloric energy intake. That means we, will, we should only be it, uh, sourcing 40 to 45 percent of our caloric intake from rice. Uh, at UPLP, we have a presidential memo that we have to mix corn at 30 percent. Okay. So uh, that means only 70 percent for, for rice. So that is uh, more or less uh, approaching this this figure. That's about perhaps if you are a male, it will be about 45 percent. I did not yet uh, perform the arithmetic later on. Okay. So the 
there are two ways of answering the question. It will be very difficult to be self-sufficient in price if we will be <laughs> consuming this much. And uh, I'm, I'm posting this, this question. Is it, it due to this heavy rice intake that many Filipinos now are suffering with high uh, glucose, high, <laughs> high, high sugar in your blood? So uh, that's why there are stuff on pill rice. Perhaps uh, uh, we should also uh, don't drink too, too uh, much high eating quality rice so that the Filipinos will not eat so much rice. And second, perhaps we have to promote brown rice. Because if we are to eat brown rice, it's definite. You cannot consume 114 or 120 kilograms per capita. Okay? Uh, the most uh, will be about 80, 80 75 uh, kilograms uh, per capita. So easily, we are self sufficient uh, with that. When we discuss uh, rice self sufficiency, we all, we feel rice or brown, we only discuss about production. We, do, we don't consider. But this time, I dwell a bit on the consumption side. <coughs> so, I was in, in, in uh, field rice uh, news uh, yesterday, so they gave us this kind of projection that by 2025, we're about 20, uh, 120 million. Uh, if we are to be self sufficient in rice, next year we should be producing uh, 22. Uh, million tons. I feel to uh, this decimal uh, point here. And our uh, average yield should be 4.9 tons per hectare. Our average yield right now is uh, 4 tons uh, per hectare. Uh, why this high requirement? Because of our milling recovery is too low, 59%. But uh, if only we could increase our milling recovery to 65%, then our projection rice requirement will be lower, at the same time, lower yield per hectare. <coughs> Can we increase our national milling recovery from 59% to 65%? Of course, uh, there are always to answer the yes and no. The yes, if all those inefficient small mills like in Bay, our small mill, uh, our small mills are only giving 52 percent uh, recovery. So we have to shift to bigger and more efficient rice mills, which can give up to 70 percent uh, milling recovery. Again, if we are to shift to brown rice, the milling recovery for brown rice is 72 percent. So again, uh, those technical or mechanical aspects of production, making rice available to our plate are so important if you are to achieve a self-sufficiency rice. But just the same, whatever efficiency that we have to undertake, still the need to increase would be there, okay? <coughs> Increasing or producing more rice What's the main challenge? Producing them in less land, water, and nutrients. Uh, if you are listening to the presidential, vice presidential aspirants, they said that one of the things that we should do is to have to be not a national land use code, which has been there for the last uh, 30 years. <coughs> That's the reason why we have lots of land use conversion. Good lands, prime lands are converted to non agriculture or non productive food producing purposes. Uh, you know very well that water is abundant during rainy or flooding months. Uh, but right now we're suffering from water in many parts of the country. So we have to learn how to use water conserve water. Uh, for rice, uh, I'll show you the data. What about nutrients? Of course, uh, uh, we 
cannot growing any crop for that matter. It's just like an input output system. Simple mass balance. Mass in, mass out. So we need as we increase yield, we need more nutrients. Where will those nutrients come from? <coughs> Survey. 
but the Bureau of Soils and Water Management is claiming that we have about 5 million hectares of irrigable areas. Of course, this will not only be for rice, but that would increase the productivity. So, uh, uh, we, 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 we have uh, really four options to increase uh, the yield. Uh, how about uh, the management uh, component? Uh, input application, okay. Uh, for those who are still uh, promoting uh, uh, chemical inputs, they're saying our yields are not yet uh, at the optimum because we are applying less inputs. Okay. Uh, many things are, are associated uh, with yield, uh, with this big word management. Uh, if you see the fields, many fields are not properly or optimally prepared uh, for planting. Uh, <coughs> as an agronomist, I always uh, mention that there are various growth windows because its growth stages of the rice plant or any crop for that matter has unique or specific environmental requirements. And that's the reason why uh, timing of planting is very important. Uh, later on, this is my topic on spatial I will discuss. Cultivation and weeding, well, uh, uh, if the weeds will be growing ahead of the crop, then yields will also be, uh, be uh, uh, optimized. Uh, fertilizer application practices under or High application is not also uh, quite uh, good for the crop. Like, for instance, uh, one hybrid variety suffered the uh, hoppers infestation this just crop, crop, crop year. And the reason that they were saying is that uh, fer uh, farmers applied so much uh, nitrogen fertilizer, they are applying as much as 20 bucks per hectare. It's more than 400 kilograms per hectare. And uh, they're applying, they're planting it at two bends, 20 centimeter by 15 centimeter. So, uh, of course, the vision is very necessary. Harvesting and the milling practices, as I was mentioning, uh, as if we're just throwing rice. If our milling recovery is 58 or 59 percent, more so 52 percent. At 52%, if our optimal milling recovery is about 72%, then we're, as if we're throwing 20% <laughs> rice. So, much need to be done on this uh, portion. Of course, uh, milling recovery is also a function of varieties, a function of the drying, whether it is sun drying, uh, many, many of our rice are being dried on the roads. <laughs> uh, so many factors, uh, the timing of harvesting. Uh, on the other end, it's also a factor of variety. Uh, some varieties need to be harvested uh, early at 85% uh, maturity because they're scattered. If you harvest them at 90% maturity, then many grains will shatter. So you'll not be covered. So we have many sources of productivity available to us. As I said, uh, while ago, hybrids, uh, we can get as much as 12 tons per hectare already. Okay. Uh, in Cordillera, they, they call one village barangay hybrid. <laughs> because practically all the farmers are planting hybrid. Uh, I know some farmers in Tarlac, they claim that they will not plant any other variety except hybrid. Because they are getting as much as 9 tons up to 10 tons per hectare. Of course, our inbreds, uh, they can yield as high as 10 tons. Uh, I was told that uh, JSR8 uh, has achieved about 10 tons per hectare again in Bay Laguna. Okay. Uh, JSR green super rice. Of course, it's not bred by green rice, it's bred by uh, Indian uh, rice breeder meal. Cropping intensity, uh, uh, they're now starting uh, to increase to 
plant rice three times a year. Uh, in the data I was looking uh, provided by me, uh, our cropping intensity 2015, 2015 is 1.56. Okay. It means even if they are irrigated, uh, there's not much supply of water. That's why it's supposed to be if it is irrigated, the uh, cropping intensity is two. Meaning you can plant minimum two crops. But can be planted in the vegetable, can also be planted uh, during uh, the dry season. For rain fed, of course, during any new months, okay, uh, uh, it's hard to get one crop. And that's the reason why many farmers are complaining, okay, or they were hit by, by El Nino. Uh, in a normal weather, they, they can easily, easily plant two crops, okay. But they think we, we have normal weather, they did not kill it pagasa. So in, in Tagalog, they call it Takala Suerte Sila. So they took a chance, uh, but uh, incidentally, they were hit by, the, uh, by a lead towards the end of the traffic season. That's why they were complaining. Uh, a while ago, I was mentioning the land area expansion uh, seemed not feasible because of, of our limited land area. Okay. So our option will be more areas to be irrigated. And 
there's also difficulties of sourcing water uh, uh, to uh, make uh, water available to our rice. At the same time, uh, uh, chemical agriculture, conventional agriculture is high oil-based uh, manufacturer, so energy intensive. And there are so many consequences uh, of this uh, high oil base. Uh, when you burn oil, at the same time, you are releasing carbon dioxide, uh, 7 to 80 percent of the carbon uh, emissions due to burning oil. So, as a whole, our current crop production is high carbon and also high water uh, food, food plants. <coughs> There's an estimate, one ton of nitrogen fertilizer used 1.8 tons of oil, uh, 12 tons of carbon dioxide equivalent emitted, and 108 tons of water. What about organic system? Rice seed grown under organic system had plateau, 45 tons per hectare, even after that's all our conversion stage. Because if you shift to organic, uh, uh, farmers have to expect uh, uh, yield decline 40 to 50 percent. So if they're getting five tons or six tons, that will be about two to three tons. Of course, many farmers don't want to do that. Uh, of course, some uh, organic farmers are also claiming that they could get a yield of 10 tons per hectare or even up to 12 tons per hectare. Uh, last year, organ, uh, uh, national awarding for rice at the reported the, uh, 12 tons per hectare. Only is also applying 12 tons of uh, compost. <coughs> so, what do you want to see thing happen? Organic ground rice should have comparable yield output left relative to organically or chemically grown rice. Uh, so we need to, uh, the need, there's a need to increase rice yield to feed the growing population in the Philippines. Uh, of course, uh, uh, all this initiative, uh, we have already, uh, Republic Act 1068 of 2010, for the Organic Agricultural Act, where it says uh, in the declaration of policy, the policy of the state to promote but we develop, further implement the practice of organic agriculture in the Philippines. So, we need to find or to shift alternative systems uh, of rice production that is also high yielding to, to address the pitfalls of chemical or conventional uh, rice production that is uh, low in water and carbon footprint and uh, environmental health hazards associated with it. So, uh, the one alternative that we thought would uh, address this requirement is the system of rice intensification. Uh, we need to have a good production of irrigated rice for poor resource limited households. Uh, and it was going to have been tested in 50 countries gave higher yields uh, with reduced inputs. In 2011, a farmer in India claimed that uh, the, he obtained 22.4 tons uh, per hectare, beating the world record set by the famous scientist Yuan Lopin by uh, 3 tons. Of course, the super high yield claims uh, opened as a right to many criticism. Sinclair and Doberman that think that the SRI reports were based on unconfirmed field observation or PUFOS. They questioned the reported yields, pointing out the needs for clear and detailed information about experimental procedures. So, uh, McDonald uh, also asserted more rigorous and systematic research is needed to identify the potential targets of SRI. Uh, Blober, uh, uh, said that uh, why there's so much resistance to SRI from some quarters of the scientific community is this disagreement over
over the efficacy of SRI in particular to a focus on and preoccupation with just the technical factors in agricultural innovation. <clears throat> yeah, uh, for those who are familiar with SRI, there are at least five principles and practices. One is the use of uh, small seeding, 8 to 12 day old seeding, widely spaced ranging from 20 to 20 up to 50 by 50 centimeters. First, this study I just covered. Alternate uh, wetting and drying. Uh, but the drying of soil uh, need not be literal, uh, so it should be moist soil. They use organic rather than mineral fertilizer, although they are also literal. Frequent weeding, preferably using surface uh, rotary foam. <coughs> SRI is a system and not a package of technology. When someone adopts SRI, uh, we may perhaps ask the question, is there a need to adopt all the five features? So, uh, in my case, I did not adopt all the five features. That's why perhaps later on, uh, uh, those who are uh, so specific of those five uh, features or practices SRI we claim that uh, what I did is not really SRI because <coughs> uh, I did not uh, perform square planting rather I did global uh, planting but in this case uh, my the basic questions that I tried to answer uh, were two is the square planting pattern best for SRI organic or what cultivar type of genotype is best for, for SRI <coughs> why they need to identify varieties because uh, uh, the current varieties are not bred for organic, more so for SRI. Uh, SRI claims that you know, we produce uh, so much steer. So the claim of SRI cultivation is inducing this variety to produce lots of pillars planted in wide spacing. But this leads to differential ages of pillars. Uh, late pillars become useless metabolic sinks as they are simply abort aborted. Okay. And the planting pattern is also related to pillar. So how do you achieve uh, early buildup of pillars? So that's uh, why uh, we tested these uh, different varieties in three different planting patterns, still the square planting, and the 10 by 40 centimeter and then the double row, uh, 20 by 20 centimeter by 10 centimeter and in between is 40 centimeter. So uh, this uh, uh, figures, uh, picture summarizes what we have done. So from the seedling preparation, okay, uh, land preparation, okay, and then uh, uh, leveling the soil is not yet properly uh, putting the marks uh, to be able to plant uh, uh, into double rows uh, and then uh, uh, trying to assure that uh, the, the, uh, the seedlings are properly planted. Uh, to begin with, or uh, right now I should admit that uh, planting in double rows it's a little bit difficult for our regular planters because they are accustomed in planting in bay, for instance, in that square of planting which that's already marked. You know? But uh, but before they go into actual planting, I, I requested them to plant slowly. Don't be in a hurry. Anyway, I will be paying you on a fairly basis. Yeah. So plus, of course, uh, free food. <laughs> Again, another unique practice, uh, how do you achieve yield? Because as I was mentioning, input in is equal to input. How do you supply the nutrient required to achieve high yield under organic? So in this case, I followed the nature of farming, uh, but we modified the use of available materials. Okay? So it's a compost mix. Oh, sorry.
compost mixture of cattle manure and carbonized rice salt sprayed with iron of 1 liter per ton and applied at 5 tons per hectare before the final harvest. So lots of uh, manure for compost. Uh, we use indigenous microorganisms applied during the first harvest of 2 gallons per hectare to facilitate crop uh, weeds residue to uh, And then we also use liquid cattle manure fertilizer a 2 kg dam and 2 kg molasses mix in 200 liters water uh, uh, in plastic drum. So, uh, ano po ang naming basis na why we did the use li uh, liquid cattle manure? Earlier, one of my uh, uh, graduate student did the research work on evaluating different manure types or compost. She claimed that the best is use, is to use five tons of uh, fresh cattle dung. The problem is, where did you get five tons of fresh cattle dung? So, uh, I use the principle of amplification, or how to quantumize the total pharmacy. So, instead of using uh, five tons, how? Because in that particular study, she was also claiming that the cattle manure, fresh cattle manure, had the highest number of microorganisms. Uh, what are those microorganisms? Uh, they don't know. Oh, pathogen perhaps, so very visual microorganisms. But uh, he, he obtained the, the, the best result in that manure. So I, I tried this, this uh, uh, liquid uh, manure preparation. Uh, at, at the back of my mind, the main, the main intention is to amplify, to increase the number of microorganisms. So, we did this uh, uh, mixture, uh, uh, stirring it for seven days, then we, we applied. We repeatedly do this in, in two weeks, four weeks, and six weeks after transplanting. Of course, uh, as you will see the result later. A great feeling period, another preparation was uh, tested. Uh, the middle soft species of banana stem were cut into small pieces and mixed with molasses at one to one ratio of vibrating. This mixture was allowed to ferment for three weeks and diluted at one and fresh water, then sprinkled the diluted solution to the test plus. What's the basis? Uh, uh, banana are high potash. So at grain filling stage, so, uh, the, the, the crop needs a lot of potash. <coughs> So, uh, this is about a month after, after a plant. So, you can see. Yes, the result for variety trial, okay? So, uh, incidentally, the highest yield in this particular yield trial is uh, the Korean variety. 23. Uh, and then we have also in insect to 40, is about 6.99. Why I use RC18? Well, to begin with, we set up the dog, this uh, planting pattern, and then we also planted these different varieties. Uh, we have three season. Uh, trial and RC18 was so consistently giving us uh, good yields. That's why we we uh, uh, get uh, RC18. We tried RC18 for this uh, planting pattern. Uh, with, uh, Dr. Lee, the director for Copilia, we met last uh, yesterday, so I was mentioning about this study. So we will try again with young later. Okay, what about the planting pattern? As you could see, okay, uh, the yields the yield was highest in the total row planting pattern. It's about 8.49 tons per hectare. The single row, uh, 6.5. 54 tons, 6.67 in the 2020. Uh, 
Uh, what's the main reason? The main reason is the high initial plant population. It's about 333,000 in the total row. The single row and the square plant is about 250,000. As you can see, uh, the per hectare number of panicles is about 3.49 uh, in the uh, uh, double row. <coughs> Why the yield in the double row planting pattern was the highest? We attributed this, I attributed this to more pillars produced per panicle, with field grains per panicle, and the weight of grains were comparable to the single rows. The initially high plant population, 33% uh, than in the single row, was sustained. Uh, we produced about uh, 3.5 billion uh, pillars of panicles.
Oh, it's so difficult to be there. You can trample. You will trample the siblings very easily. Okay? And you will be winning too many. But with the 44 by 40, you don't need to win uh, the interrupt. Of course, uh, there's still a need to hand pull some of these weeds. And for those who are growing ducks, and there, there is ample space for the ducks to grow. Uh, Grace. Uh, so we end up with uh, more panicle wearing in the double rows under this organic and SRI and it's relative to uh, conventional. I also did this stepwise regression analysis and it showed that the number of productive panicle bearing grains or high percent field grains uh, uh, were the ones uh, uh, left out. Of course, the, the R square is not that high, it's only about 10%. Anyway, that only that parameter was the only one uh, selected. <coughs> we just explained uh, that this parameter is the high yield determinant for rice. Uh, and then earlier, the side is something saying that same size and more grains per panicle and more panicles per square meter are the main determinants of. Having more productive fillers, so more grains per panicle is now the gene type, but uh, manipulated through the spacing. Uh, by the way, our hybrids are getting, are giving more or higher yields because they have more grains per panicle, up to 300 grains per panicle, whereas our inbreds uh, will only give up to 150 grains per panel. Uh, Stuck was suggesting that they need to study the optimum plant spacing to have more plants producing pillars to maximize the interception of solar radiation at the time of plant initiation and flowering. So we have this interdependence of plant spacing, breeding, irrigation, age of seedlings, cultivar types, Inorganic farming must also be studied. Okay. So, the double row planting pattern is not the usual planting pattern, it's still the square planting pattern. So, how do we convince farmers of doing this? Uh, again, uh, uh, in, in Russia, I was, I was uh, uh, requesting our staff there to at least uh, put NG to a rotary wheeler if uh, the recommendation or requirement is to cultivate the interrow at least three times uh, it will be diff difficult to be this <laughs> manual, manually done what will be the impacts of this study? There, is, there will be reduced water consumption of rice from the uh, reported 5,000 liters per kilogram to as low as 2,250 liters per kilogram. That's something like 55% reduction. Uh, so this opens the possibility of expanding the area to be irrigated using the same irrigation facilities. Uh, growing rice through the organic method, because we excluded the uh, agrochemicals in our study, this will mean 40 to 50% reduction in energy yield. <coughs> In 2006, we imported 1.7 million tons. The nitrogen content there will be 385,505 uh, tons of nitrogen. Uh, one kilogram nitrogen used 1.8 liter diesel equivalent to manufacturing. That means 693 million liter diesel oil equivalent to manufacturing. Uh, we did not include the, the energy transport. Uh, a 12 kilogram carbon dioxide equivalent per kilogram nitrogen, that means 4.63 million tons of CO2 emission. Uh, it is labor intensive. SRI is labor intensive because it 
is requiring 38 additional months for seedling preparation, transplanting, or the rebuilding of manual meat. But this also provides the prospect of increasing rice output using less water or less energy, and at the same time, decarbonizing rice production. I was talking to, in the telephone with my cell phone a while ago with uh, an organic farmer in Isabella. Uh, if we can increase organic rice yield by 8 tons per hectare, then we should be willing to pay our workers at 300 pesos per, per day and giving them food perhaps. Okay. So we need to share the bounties of nature. Otherwise, nobody will work. Why, why are uh, uh, rural labor migrating to urban areas? It's because of the low wages given to them. Of course, complicated for you. With the low price of rice at 13 pesos and 50 centavos per kilogram right now, because of the, it is the height of harvesting, because we are, ang sabi nila, the imported rice that just arrived. Why uh, imported rice should come at harvest time? Kaya ho, bagsak na naman ang presyo ng pangalan yun. And they say, is claiming that they are buying at 50, uh, 70 pesos per kilogram. But any packet would only buy less than 5% of our rice produced. And the study is that any should buy at least 15% of our rice produced. Okay. So, yun po ang isang problema ng rice industry, or mga rice farms. So, to sum up, <coughs> I would claim this modified SRI uh, uh, using double row uh, at the potential of uh, increasing our rice yield. And, you know, uh, some farmers are averse to using young seedlings. But we can grow as, as old as 15 days. And you can have a you. Now, if you don't want one seedling per hill, perhaps two seedling per hill. But not 10 seedlings per hill. <laughs> Some farmers are doing it. Uh, so with that, we will be only utilizing about uh, uh, 15 kilograms per hectare of, of seeds. At one seedling per hill, then we will only be using 7 kilograms. Okay? So uh, even if the farmers will shift to, to hybrid rice, okay, if they will be adopting SRI okay, at one seedling per hill, then they can reduce the seedling requirement at 7 kilograms instead of 18 kilograms. So what, how much is one kilogram? It's about 420 pesos per kilogram. <clears throat> So my conclusion, as our organic grown through the local rose planting pattern and using but that particular variety, I do not know what is the adapted variety, season adapted variety for your location. But so far as my condition, we found out that RCA is still, still uh, a good variety. It can increase rice yield, it will minimize eliminate the toxicity, help risk in the use of pesticide, reduce the water, energy bill, and carbon emission associated with oil based in turn, reducing the carbon emission and rice production. Uh, modified SRI event is water, energy, and climate change adapted farming. As well, also address the health and wellness uh, concerns of our people. So, in quote, uh, uh, thank you for your coming and listening. I would like to acknowledge that this uh, study was funded uh, by RD Topia. Uh, I would like also to acknowledge with thanks the cooperation of uh, the landowner who allowed us to do the fifth trial of the farm and the transplanter who bear with us the damnest plant is small and one seed per year. Uh, <coughs> yeah, well, uh, I was able to present the paper in a way uh, and it was funded by Sherpa and because of that, uh, one of the requirements as uh, 
Kaya <laughs> I'm happy at least uh, I was given this opportunity to present not only in, in, in the outside of the country. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Mendoza, for that uh, highly informative um, presentation on the on SRI, on System of Rising Intensification. Am I correct? <laughs> so the floor is now open for questions, insights, or comments on the presentation that we very much Huh? <laughs> Ano po mga tanong? Kaya Dr. Mendoza? Ano, Jenny, kaya natin gawin yan sa ano? Yes, sir. Yun yung hinihisip ko, sir. Because we are thinking that Agusan is uh, has uh, low solar radiation. And you mentioned earlier that uh, we, we we have no idea yet on that uh, study. So, yung inano po na ilang Mondays po yung gagamitin kasi it's uh, it's a new technology uh, method so of course bago ma, ma, mani bago yung mga farmers sa pagtanim ng double row so ilang araw kaya yung it uh, magagamit ng farmer na magtanim ng isang hektarya so how may mondays po ang kailangan to shift from uh, uh, run, uh, from square to double row in bay uh, the contracted Mondays is about 15 Mondays per hectare. Okay? So, perhaps double it. Okay. 30 Mondays. Okay. But with time, when uh, they gain skill and they master the practice, I don't see any difference. So, ganun ang aking approach. Eh. Double it. It's a new, and uh, hopefully we can also develop a mechanical transplanter for double row. Why not? If you can do it for you know square planting, you can also do it for double row planting. Okay. If we can demonstrate that double row planting will really increase yield, okay. <laughs> but. But with the problem on pests that we are seeing right now, uh, I think, I think uh, this method of planting would be one of the answers. Because you re relax the environment. We do not achieve immediately uh, uh, canopy closure. You allow light penetration. And these stems are sturdier. Mas matigas ang stem nila kasi na Oh, yung ating mga kaibigan and mga ano natin sa field rice, what do you think? Who is working on the related uh, aspect of space? Uh, Any other question? Can you use the yes, microphone? And, and please identify yourself. He's from Indonesia. Yes. Okay, thank you. <coughs> Uh, I'm Asma Hansa. Uh, I just want to share what's, uh, what we did in Indonesia. So, when the farmer changed from the chemically uh, rice, lowland rice to SRI, to organic uh, SRI, so there's a decrease in the productivity of the yields, maybe until two years. So, uh, uh, about four season. So during this decreasing in the years, maybe uh, the intervention from the government should come because the the income of the farmer will uh, decrease. That is the, the first one. And the second one is regarding the uh, double row. So in our institution, uh, we offer the farmer from the double row, three row, four row, until uh, sometimes six row. And uh, farmer prefer to four and uh, six row, not double row. I don't know in, uh, in this country, it will be. Thank you. Yeah, uh, 
Then if we, as, as far as I know it, we, we are only uh, offering that is square planting, random planting, and even direct seeding, broadcasting the seeds. Okay. Uh, there's no conscious efforts right now to promote uh, single road or whole road, the, the way you are doing it in, in Indonesia. Medyo natutulog yung agronomy sa atin. Only the active disciplines are the plant breeding, plant breeders. No? That's why we have to work also. <laughs> the soils and agronomy people should also work to contribute more. Is there problems appearing already? Hello, Mr. Uh, Nicole Amantibo from Belcom. Tanong ko lang po is, paano niyo po kinakommunicate yung, uh, yung findings niyo or yung advice niyo sa mga, sa mga farmers po para ma-inform ma, ma po sila dun sa methods na nandiscover niyo? In, in one of the picture, you, you saw uh, visitors coming uh, from uh, my visitors have uh, it came from, from La Union Bank. So, uh, incidentally, uh, we informed them that I was doing SRI. I think it's all my personal. So, parang personal to person communication. How about it by, uh, well, farmers, uh, some farmers who are, who are visiting also the farm and trying to see. Uh, incidentally, as I've said, uh, there's no institutional way yet done to, to promote this, this kind of activity. And uh, uh, I hope uh, after the seminar, my, my friends from Philrise will try to, <laughs> to revalidate <laughs> what I've done. You know? uh, so, marami kasing kaming gagawin eh, no trend management to avoid the yield decline, as I was mentioning. Because if you shift to organic farming, and you will not be also doing uh, alternative or, or sub substitutional uh, activity to address the nutrient required requirement of the crop uh, in lieu for your chemical fertilizer, obviously the yield will decline. Okay? Uh, it's a simple input-output system. So that's another complication, not only the spacing. And I was also mentioning, hey, you need to rotabate, you need to aerate, you need to cultivate the inter rows. Okay? Uh, on a large scale, of course, we did this in a small scale, in 0.25 hectare. So it would only require two to three hours or one month uh, doing it manually. If it is a hectare, oh, you cannot do that. Okay. So we need to have a motorized uh, uh, what do you call that? Uh, rot rototiller. Okay. We don't have yet one like that. But I, I talked to Dr. Lee. He said uh, we, we already have a motorized uh, rototiller. <laughs> I will meet uh, tomorrow. So in a way I would claim it's... Is it new? <laughs> It's relatively new approach in planting. So we, we need more more researcher working with the farmers. So we're doing it already in Murcia. In Murcia, you're right. They also tried the three rows. Uh, but the thing is, because they're doing it in three hectare, four hectare, without this motorized rototiller. Uh, I pity the worker <laughs> because it's so hot. No? So I, I, I only do it very early in the morning for my exercise and after doing it for perhaps three or four rotation, and I, I leave it already to my partner worker. Okay? Oh, by the way, I pay my worker at 300 pesos per day. <laughs> and at 10, p 10 in the morning, I already advise him, don't work in the farm anymore. You, you find work under the shade of trees. <laughs> so 
we need also a different approach to our workers right now. So uh, they, will, they will collaborate and maintain. Yes, no, uh, are you raising your hand? <laughs> yes. Okay. Thank you, Ted, partner in <laughs> Um, I'm Pam Fernandez from the Department of Agronomy. I just, I have, we have encountered this at I the first time when the doctor of law came to the British and gave a talk, and he was not entertained by the high scientists because he, he thought his science is wacky or not out of God, but it's not high school of science. It's awful. <laughs> Yeah. And, uh, uh, and then the next time he came, he slowly, you know, we accepted that until finally the government gave some funds for research in SRI because the NGOs, the NGOs were implementing. But you know, it is another case of uh, a phenomenon that presents itself already, but science has not uh, uh, on, not yet because. Uh, it's a different kind of mindset. If we don't understand the true nature of rice, then we should give it lots of water and transplanting it very way. But, you know, by the nature of rice, rice is a sun plant. Rice makes it looks it's like the sun. So that it does not really need a lot of water. The rest that we have, we have forgotten that. And so many technologies are available already, but science cannot explain yet. And this one has already shown itself, it's repeated all over the world, that the yields are very high. But then we cannot believe, we need research. We need those statistically significant results to, to believe. But it's there. You can get 20, kilo, 20 tons per hectare, 15 tons per hectare. The economics of it being studied already. And we're usually, you know, the, those with very solid structures are the last ones to adapt. And that's how we are here in the academy, in the institutions. But really, it's a movement that is really gaining like now in our face. And we don't need, I mean, it's nice that Ted, Dr. Mendoza is doing some research. The NGOs are doing it. And in fact, one farmer who's doing it is part of the, of the contestants, one of the contestants in this high yield uh, competition. They did not allow him the next time because they said unbelievable results. I think you are cheating. But that guy combined his SRI with indigenous microorganisms. And he had really very interesting results. And so we have to change our mindset. It's just not really about these uh, usual things given to us in our agronomy classes. But, you know, there's something much, much more natural, much better. And that this is the time now that we have to harness that. Otherwise, otherwise, not only one and I will be last in the race. Thank you. Thank you.